All right, so in today's lecture, we will cover reading 13 in economics. But first, let's just let me give you an overview of what this whole topic is about. So economics is 10% of your overall exam, three study sessions. The first study session is microeconomic analysis, where we will talk about demand, supply from the perspective of a consumer, from the perspective of a firm. Then we will talk about market structures, so perfect competition, monopoly, oligopoly, etc. So all this is what you might have seen in a basic college level uh, microeconomics course. But what I have mentioned to some of you already, this material has changed a lot since 2011. In 2011, the economics material was material that you would see in a typical economics textbook. This material has now been written by financial analysts. So the examples and the way it is written is very different from before and I think it's much better. So you, I think it's much more interesting. So even though the concepts will be familiar, but in the way they've been applied, I think it will be more useful. Then study session five is macroeconomics, basics, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, prices, economic growth, business cycles, and then finally monetary and fiscal policy. Then study session eight is completely new in 2012. And this is again interesting stuff. It talks about economics in a global context, international trade, currency exchange rates and so on. So this is big picture economics, a lot to cover and I think you will enjoy this material. Okay. Today we will focus on reading 13. There is again a lot of material here and I've already mentioned to some of you that in 2011 the first three readings have been compressed and put into one reading over here. So they've eliminated some details and I think made this more interesting. I will try and cover as much of this as possible and then at the end I'll advise you how to study this material. Okay, so the specific plan for today, I'll give you an overview of the types of markets. Then we will understand demand, demand curve, the demand function, talk about supply, then talk about aggregating demand, aggregating supply. So all these concepts will make a whole lot more sense when you leave this room today. Then we'll talk about consumer surplus and producer surplus, market interference. So what happens when governments try to interfere with the smooth operation of a market. We'll then go on to talk about various kinds of elasticity. So own price uh, elasticity, what happens to quantity demanded when prices change, income elasticity, cross elasticity, and then we will conclude if we have time today by calculating different kinds of elasticities. So that's uh, a somewhat ambitious plan for the day. Okay, the way I have generally structured this lecture, it's totally based on the curriculum and I have looked at the curriculum material which is almost 60 pages worth of reading and I looked at all the learning objective statements and material in the curriculum that did not relate to a learning objective statement I skipped. So I'm focusing on the core stuff and this is a strategy used by Schweizer and most others. We don't have Schweizer yet. so we are relying completely on the curriculum which is in a way a good thing okay so different types of markets one basic kind of market is a factor market a factor is something that companies use or is used to produce an output so for example the most classic type of factor is labor okay so is there a market for labor there is a market for labor who demands labor firms companies <coughs> demand labor who supplies labor households supply labor when we talk about price in this market what's the price it's the wage rate okay so in your basic uh, supply and demand you will have wage rate over here and quantity of labor over here so the demand for labor will look something like this where if wage rate is high the demand for labor will be low if wage rate is low then the demand will be high so what are some other factors typical other factors are land capital etc so these are the things that you use to produce stuff so that's factor markets what about goods or product markets 
so this is obvious this is what you can relate to so when companies produce stuff or companies produce services the market for those goods and services are either referred to as goods markets or product markets saving or savings so what what are savings from a consumer perspective or from a, let's say household perspective you have a certain amount of income so that's the wages that you get and then you have consumption so the income minus the consumption is savings what happens with those savings you can invest those savings you can buy bonds you can buy stocks so that can help increase your income through either dividends or or coupon payments or interest on bonds another way of looking at it is those savings through your financial institutions financial intermediaries make their way to capital markets and capital markets are at the heart of what we do here in this uh, CFA course capital markets in very simple terms are the markets for equity and debt so when companies need to finance themselves when companies need to grow there are two broad ways in which they get money either they can get money by borrowing so that would be debt financing where does that borrowed money come from it can come from the savings of households or companies can finance themselves through equity so households through their savings put their money into shares or simplistically put people can buy shares of companies so companies get funding but in turn households then have a share or a part ownership in that company so how does all this money flow between households and companies it flows through financial intermediaries and capital markets okay we don't know need to get into too much detail right now from uh, economics perspective at level 1 as long as you know these basic terms you are in good shape and just to highlight the sort of questions you will get i'm quite sure are fairly simple so it doesn't should not take a phd in economics to answer these questions so salman what's the answer to one so when you get a question like this the first thing that you do is you underline this least the cfa loves to use words like this least accurately described okay so you underline the least okay so and we are talking about factor markets okay so is land a factor of production yes yes okay so it is a factor of production so you cross that out assembly line workers so workers so they are also labor so they are also a factor so you cross that out this clearly is not a fact capital market securities is clearly not a factor market so that's the correct answer then okay all of you think about number 2 and then i will <coughs> pick someone okay asad so most accurately so a companies the market for companies yeah actually so this is that uh, yes again things like most accurate companies i don't know so buying and selling companies where does that happen yeah, that's maybe capital markets to some extent uh, i think this would be lobbying uh, legal and lobbying services all right so so this is this is just a fancy <laughs> in in the us people would be more familiar with this so for example uh, in in the us uh, let's say somebody hires a lobbying service to promote your political case okay so that so people are providing a service that they will lobby congressmen and women and so on so that's a service buying and selling that service is a it's goods and products market it's a service but they all even services fall within the product market this is like the market for shoes okay that's also a product market so the product means the end product of what companies produce does it have to be a physical thing or could it also be a service it can also be a service and they just picked a unusual service when lawyers sell their legal service is that a product market yeah it is a product market okay it would be better if it's called the market for products and services but when people just say product market the service is implied in there okay so here again the answer is c okay so once you understand the basic definitions the questions will not be too hard this is example 1 out of the curriculum okay uh, okay this i have already covered okay what about now we will talk the way i have structured this is 
uh, that, that was uh, in the curriculum section one was just a high level introduction section two was brief it talked about these different kinds of markets and then most of the rest of these slides are based on the curriculum this is section 3.1 which talks about the demand function the demand curve and so on okay so in the past when we talked about supply and demand at least in the 2011 curriculum we didn't have any of these fancy equations so now a financial analyst has written this so you need to deal it's become more quantitative okay now at a high level the quantity demanded for a certain product x what is it a function of what does it depend on obviously it will depend on the price of x okay what else would it depend on it might depend on something like the income that people have it might depend on the price of other products okay so and several other variables but these are the main ones the example in the curriculum so this this thing that we have here is called a demand function where we are saying the quantity demanded is a function of several variables now if somebody does a lot of analysis on a given product let's say that we are talking about gasoline okay so in the us petrol is referred to as gasoline or gas for short okay so we are talking about the household demand for gasoline in a given town and somebody does a fair amount of research and comes up with this equation that the quantity demanded for x x being gasoline is equal to 8.4 minus 0.4 times the price of gasoline does it make sense that we have a negative over here it makes sense because what happens if the price of gasoline goes up then the quantity of demand sh should go down so it makes sense to have a negative number there i refers to the average household income so does it make sense that this is a positive so if income goes up it makes sense that the quantity demanded goes up and then py refers to the average price of cars or automobiles okay does it make sense that if car if the price of automobiles go so if automobiles become more expensive then what should happen to the demand for gasoline for also it makes sense to have a negative number over here so you will not be asked to derive these demand functions but you should be able to read it and understand it so this is a basic demand function that is given to you now when you look at a demand curve which is one version of which is which is shown over here so when you draw a given demand curve what happens there is you have the price of that item on the y axis so the price of gasoline which is px and then the quantity of gasoline on the x axis and then you hold the other variables constant so you say that let's say the average income is 50 and the price of y the average price of automobiles is 20 so these are numbers in thousands but that doesn't really matter so if you plug in the i equal to 50 and the price of cars equal to 20 then this particular equation simplifies to to this so we can then say that the price is equal to 28 minus 2.5 times q so then we have a simple relationship that is relating the price of gasoline to the quantity okay and that is this line over here all right so when we talk about the demand function this is the demand function when we talk about the demand curve this is the demand curve where we have assumed a certain income we have assumed a certain price for the other product which is cars and then we draw this line which is the demand function the demand curve will always be downward sloping because when the price goes down the quantity demanded goes up okay so that is this scenario okay now in economics and actually in other disciplines there is always this question of when do we move along the curve and when does the curve itself move so if you look at a basic demand curve that we just saw we had price of gasoline on the y axis and quantity demanded on the x axis and we had a demand curve downward sloping demand curve like this when you 
only change the price of gasoline and nothing else then you move along the curve okay so if initially the price of gasoline is three dollars and the quantity demanded is let's say 10 if you decrease the price and don't change anything else then the quantity demanded goes to let's say 12 so if all you are doing is changing the price then you move along the curve however if something else changes so if income on average goes up so if something else changes then the demand curve shifts all right so if income on average goes up then the demand curve will shift to the right let's say the for some reason the price of automobiles goes up then what will happen yeah. yeah so if the price of automobiles goes up then the demand curve will shift to the left okay so have you understood this basic concept of when uh, actually if i were to generalize with any graph you move along the curve if the only thing that's changing is either the y axis variable or the x axis variable if anything else that is not shown on the y or the x axis changes then the demand then the, then the curve shifts or moves otherwise you just stay along that curve that is shown i will not do this right now but i want you to go ahead and do this example number 2 from the curriculum but it's i think it's very straightforward if you've understood this concept if you found this clip interesting and informative, please visit my website www.arifirfanullah.com. Here you will find a tremendous amount of useful material. Right here in the 2011 CFA video lecture series, you will find the entire level 1 curriculum for free. And most of the material here is still relevant. So this is worth looking at. The 2012 video lecture series covers both level 1 and level 2. These lectures are available for a fee. And uh, finally, down here, uh, financial management at IBA. Here you will find my lectures at IBA uh, for a course on financial management. Plus, you'll find lots of useful spreadsheets that can help you with financial modeling. So again, please visit www.arifirfanullah.com. Thank you.